Hello and welcome back to Talking Europe France Van Katz, conversation with the movers and shakers of Europe here in Brussels. We are very honoured to have with us today's guest, the latest recipient of the European Book Prize, British writer Jonathan Coe. Thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Now, your works have spanned the cultural changes that have shaped Great Britain over the past four decades and how those changes have impacted the lives of many of your characters. Your most recent novel, Middle England, comes back to the same characters as they witness the past decade of British political and social life culminating in the Brexit referendum and its aftermath. How do you react, really, to the award that you've just been given in that concept, in that context? Uh, you've been awarded the European Book Prize. Do you think you'll be the final British recipient of the, of the prize, thanks to Brexit? Uh, quite possibly. Um, as I understand it, the prize is uh, awarded to a European, an EU citizen, and... Uh, if Mr. Johnson has his way, gets re-elected in a few days' time and pulls us out on January the 31st, then I guess British writers will no longer be eligible, and that's uh, not absolutely the saddest aspect of Brexit, I don't think, but one of the, one of the sad ones. Uh, so I'm, I'm very touched by being awarded this prize at this particular moment. I see it as a nice... Uh, gesture of uh, friendship and solidarity between uh, between Britain and uh, Brussels and the EU, uh, which comes at a good moment, but as I say, at a at a kind of bittersweet moment as well. And do you think it's perhaps a symbol, in a way, of uh, of, of marking the Brexit vote by having this award given to you? Well, it might be. I mean, I I hope that the book was chosen purely on <laughs> on literary merit, but uh, there is there is a, a symbolic dimension to giving the prize to a British writer at the moment, I think, and uh, I'm just glad that it happens to be me. Okay. Uh, politics has served as a backdrop to many of your novels, uh, uh, chronicling uh, the 70s, 80s, 90s, the noughties, and even uh, up until the current date. From a literary perspective, um, could you imagine anything, could you have made it up, anything quite so dramatic as the convulsions of Brexit? No, I don't think so, and, and that's really why writing the book was a kind of compulsion. Uh, in a way which has not been true for some of my uh, more recent books. I mean, it's... My family find it very ironic that I've wound up uh, being perceived as a kind of political novelist because uh, they remember me from my teenage years being just as Benjamin Trotter is in The Rosses Club, uh, very uninterested in politics, in fact, and, you know, much more with his head in the clouds and more interested in his enthusiasms for books and film and music and so on. Uh, but I've gradually come to realise that politics, for me, uh, can't really be ignored. It's the, it's, the, it's the air that we breathe, and every so often uh, it forces its way into my books, and it does, it does kind of force its way, because you know, we would all like not to have to think of these things. We would all like to be getting on with our, uh, with our family lives, with our personal lives, with our friendships, with our careers, with our romantic lives, but... Uh, you know, there, are, there come these moments where politics just becomes inescapable, and I think that uh, Brexit is such a moment, and not just such a moment, but it's also the, be the beginning of maybe quite a long era in which political division and convulsion is going to be all around us, not just in the UK, in every European country. You say that Brexit is inescapable, but in, in the book you say, uh, in the book, uh, uh, after Brexit, uh, the voters of Britain, having made this momentous choice, uh, they didn't uh, want to think about the matter anymore, but preferred to return to everyday concerns, just like you just yeah. said, and leave the implementation to the governing class. Is that part of the problem, do you think, that uh, the vote was, was made under uh, poorly, a poorly dis uh, discussed situation? Yeah, I mean, uh, there were, you know, there were some real whoppers told during the, uh, during the uh, referendum campaign. The, uh, the £39 million pounds or whatever it was on the side of the bus for the NHS was, was one of the most obvious ones. But, it, but one, the most damaging one, in a way, I think, was this idea that Brexit could be quick and easy. Um, I think it was Liam Fox who said that the trade deal negotiated with the... EU would be the easiest in human history. And here we are, three and a half years later, still not even, uh, not even having reached step one of the negotiations, really. Uh, and, yeah, I think a lot of people, uh, maybe on both sides of the Leave Remain divide, bought into this idea that it was 
once we'd made the decision, the break could be quick and clean and easy. And of course, it's, it's not going to be any of those things, not least because what leaving the EU meant was never defined by uh, the Leave campaign. So the people who voted to leave actually voted for an infinity of different options and narrowing that down to one that satisfies everybody, well, it's a, it's a political impossibility, in fact. Mm. Um, one of the char characters that you cite in the book uh, talks of England as the land of immoderate moderation. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, later in the book, another character is uh, assaulted for, for essentially being a foreign. Uh, do you think that moderation that you're talking about, that he's talking about, was it ever really, did it ever really exist? Was it only ever superficial? Was that the problem, that it was on the, only on the surface? You know, the, some of the things that have come out after the uh, Brexit results, some of the, the, the rise in hate crime, the, uh, the increasing violence in the political language, the death threats towards politicians, the rape threats towards female politicians, you know, they're, they're very, very ugly. And I think there was a sense uh, among the British people, maybe, in years gone by that it couldn't happen here, we couldn't be like that. But any country can be like that, actually. You know, these, these, these ugly impulses are always there beneath the surface. And Brexit, uh, unfortunately, one of its worst side effects has, has, to, has to bring them to the surface and make our political language and landscape uh, very ugly at times in the last few years. Well, you mentioned there uh, the evolution of, 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 the, of the violence. Uh, in your earlier books, you talked about the IRA bomb uh, attacks of the 1970s. It's not necessarily the same level of violence now, but do you see, is there a parallel, is there an evolution of, of that, the violence of the political discourse, or did this come out of, was this a surprise, the, the, the this recent upswell in, in violence that we've seen in, in, this, in the 2019 campaign, for example, and the discourse since uh, the, the referendum? Yeah, um... It's true that in the, the Rogers Club there is a, a description of a terrorist atrocity, the, the pub bombings in Birmingham in 1974, and they cast a shadow uh, over the life of one of the main characters, a woman called Lois, and that, that shadow lasts throughout all three books, and in fact she's still uh, dealing with it at the end of Middle England. Uh, I wouldn't like to draw an exact parallel between that and what... Uh, happening to British political language and British political culture at the moment. Uh, but, you know, let's not forget that during the course of the referendum campaign and uh, as a result of a political ideology and political feelings which are bound up in some ways uh, with uh, the impulse towards Brexit, uh, a politician was murdered by uh, an extreme British nationalist. And, um, you know, these things get forgotten very quickly. I think uh, it was Nigel Farage who said on the, the morning of the, his victory in the Brexit referendum that it was, a, it, was a, it was a victory that was won without a sh single shot being fired. And that's not strictly true, I don't think, and is, is very disrespectful to the memory of, uh, of Joe Cox. Well, this, this year's uh, election campaign has also been marred by a terrorist attack the, on London Bridge. Uh, a political response to that has also drawn a degree of criticism, some people accusing some members of uh, the ruling, the political class of making political capital from that tragedy. What does this generation of political le leaders inspire in you? I, I find the political landscape in Britain very frustrating at the moment because I think we have a very uh, mediocre set of political leaders on both sides of the, of the, of the divide. And, uh, you know, for people like me who are basically on the political left, it's, it's been a strange experience in the last uh, few years seeing old adversaries like uh, Kenneth Clark and, uh, and Michael Heseltine who were, you know, who were, who were not figures that we liked during the, the 1980s and the 1990s, during the, the Thatcher years when they became uh, prominent. Uh, seeing them, even if we don't agree with everything they say, as having a kind of stature, a kind of experience, a kind of idealism, which, frankly, I don't see uh, in, the, in the current 
generation of politicians who are in power. OK, and staying with the current politicians, you've called uh, Boris Johnson, uh, you said Boris Johnson has turned out to be the most influential satirist of his generation, which, coming from a satirist such as yeah. himself, is, is perhaps uh, uh, high praise. Um, what is your view of him, then? Is that, is, that, is, that, is that his lack of seriousness or his apparent lack of seriousness, is that part of the problem? I'm very fascinated by the trajectory of uh, Johnson's career and, of course, he began his life as a reporter from Brussels for the Daily Telegraph, but, but the reports he sent back were not serious. They were, they were elaborate jokes, really, at the expense of the EU. And people are always asking me when I write a political novel, you know, do you think it will really change anything? Do you think you can, do you think you can affect political change by, uh, by writing? And usually I say no, I think that's a, a naive idea, but in the case of Boris Johnson, he really did do that because those, those reports set the tone for a whole generation of reporting uh, on the workings of the European Union, which has infected, I think is the right word, uh, the British press ever since. And, uh, you know, that's, that's language having a, having a real political effect. Um, to me, his rise is a, is a kind of parable about the... You know, I, 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 I talk a lot about the dangers of British uh, complacency and seeing aspects of our national character and being overly pleased with ourselves about them. And I think we've always prided ourselves on the British sense of humour. Uh, and indeed, when I'm, when I'm travelling abroad, I find a lot of people will tell me that they, they love the British sense of humour. Uh, but... Boris Johnson's rise to me is, is a kind of lesson in the, uh, in the dangers of that, really. Um, when you're confronted with a difficult political situation, a difficult political problem, an, in, an intractable one, uh, it's very tempting just to turn it into a joke rather than to think seriously about it and think constructively about it. And, you know, he's, he's bluffed his way into power, really. I think there's no other way of saying it. On the back of his undoubted gift for, uh, for humour and for comic improvisation. That wonderful British self-deprecation that we all like so much. Uh, but, you know, this isn't really how a politician should attain high office, I don't think, in a serious country. Mm -hmm. um, to return to uh, Middle England uh, once more, the book and Brexit itself, you divide really along generational lines to a, to a certain extent. The, many of the older characters are pro-Brexit and the younger ones are anti-Brexit. Uh, the older characters are harking back to empire and they're the ones that vote Brexit. Uh, Donald Tusk, the outgoing EU council chief, said Brexit is the real end of the British empire. Is that mm -hmm. kind of sentiment uh, something that you're trying to, uh, to express in your book? Well, I think there was a very strong uh, nostalgic um, appeal in the Leave campaign. Uh, the slogan which Dominic Cummings came up with and which won, maybe won uh, the campaign for him, wasn't take control, it was take back control, harking back towards uh, a skillfully unspecified period when Britain was maybe more in control of its own destiny, whereas whether that was the moment just before the EU or going even further back to the Second World War or going further back to the days of empire, I don't know. It was, a, it was such a clever slogan because it kind of gestured towards all of those things. The novel Middle England is in many ways a book uh, about the dangers of nostalgia. Uh, not just because right-wing populists can weaponize it and use it as a very powerful tool, which Donald Trump has done as well, but, you know, there's a nostalgia on the left as well. Um, one criticism of, uh, of Jeremy Corbyn could be that his, uh, his, his mindset, his political mindset was forged in the 1970s and has, has not uh, adapted as much as it might have done to, uh, to present circumstances. And Benjamin, uh, my main character in Middle England, uh, at the end of the novel, uh, you know, feels a strong nostalgia of, for the Britain of the 1970s, the Britain of his youth. But then the person he's talking to, who happens to be uh, a Pakistani woman in her early 20s, takes one look at him and says, I don't want to, I don't want to go back. I wouldn't want to be around in that time. That would be a terrible time for a, like, for a person like me. So we're, we're all of us tempted to look back uh, and prone to nostalgia, but, uh, you know, the, the problems we face 
are the problems of the present and the problems of the future. And maybe if I'm trying to be optimistic about Brexit at all, uh, yes, perhaps it is the end of the British Empire, uh, in which case maybe it's the beginning of a national conversation, a painful and uncomfortable beginning to a conversation about how Britain can modernise itself. Uh, one final question uh, on the situation, on parallels with the situation here in France. Do you see any parallels between the frustrations that perhaps provoked Brexit and other recent upswells of anger? for example, in France, uh, uh, with the Yellow Vest uh, movement. Is, it, is Brexit the same way of letting off steam that uh, the French have more regularly? Yes, absolutely. And um, I, I, I see many parallels between the Gilets Jaunes and, uh, and the Brexit supporters. Uh, and a big difference, which is that uh, the British people have chosen a very specific way of letting off steam. And they've actually channeled their very generalised frustration and anger into a very narrow channel, which is the channel of uh, Euroscepticism and, uh, and breaking away from the control of Brussels. Uh, this is problematic to me because um, the discontents that people feel are much more general than that and much more deep-rooted and wide-ranging than that. And uh, when people discover, as they will, that leaving Europe, leaving the EU, has not really made them feel that much better, uh, you know, that's when a whole new set of problems will start. OK. Um, that, unfortunately, is all we've got time for. Uh, but uh, many thanks, Jonathan Coe, uh, author of uh, Middle England, uh, for taking the time uh, to speak with us. Author, of course, of uh, numerous other books, uh, uh, too. Uh, do stay tuned to uh, France 24 for more news uh, after this short break. Thank you.